All right, everybody, I just wanna say thank you for those that have logged in. It's, uh, it's about 1130. Um, we're gonna wait just a couple of minutes and let everybody uh, log in, download the software and get situated. I'll give about a minute or two and I'll, I'll pop back on. So Gabe, as everyone's logging in here, you were talking about you just got back from Miami. I did. I was on a uh, cruise, um, my second cruise of the year, which I there wasn't planning on two cruises, but uh, my okay. first cruise, uh, I was with my family from Chicago and Colorado and all that. So we planned on just getting together and having a nice family cruise. And I just for fun played a hundred dollar poker tournament. And went from like about six or eight tables down to one. And uh, next thing you know, I'm asking, I'm like, hey, I'm getting pretty close to the end here. What are we playing for? I had no idea. I assumed it was cash. Okay. And uh, they said, oh, it's a free cruise. And I said, oh, oh really? okay. I mean, at the time, I was kind of like, oh, I'm already on a cruise. I don't know if I want to be on another one <laughs> in a okay. few months. Um, so I ended up winning, and I won a free cruise. And it oh, was uh, it was like designated the poker cruise of the year. So everyone who won all these satellite tournaments ended up going to this main poker cruise and I got a free okay. entry into the main event. And uh, it was like a $700,000 purse. Uh, I did not win it just, so you know, but uh, it was a fun experience. Well, how, how did you do So you were either, you were there professionals. Poker there were a few professionals. Yeah. The guys who won uh, there, I talked to them at dinner and they were like, Oh yeah, I go to Vegas every year for the, the world series of poker, which is I think a $20,000 buy-in or something. So it's, okay. these guys are serious. Wow. Well, congratulations. Yeah, I, was, I was out of my league for sure, but you know, I, I won some money in the cash game. So that was good. Welcome. Well, welcome back. Glad to have you. Yeah. So with that, I think uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, for those that don't know, my name is Brock Vandenberg. I'm with Talamar Financial. We're a lender here in San Diego. We also operate a mortgage fund. Uh, today, I have uh, Gabe Candia from Perch Wealth. Um, I've known Gabe for a couple of years. Uh, we're good friends. We actually enjoyed a football game together just recently. So, That's a good time. Um, Gabe, I just want to say thank you very much for uh, coming on today and talking about the Delaware Delaware Statutory Trust. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Looking Absolutely. To uh, you know, 1031 exchanges and Delaware Statutory Trusts are something that I get a lot of calls from my investors about, but I don't know much about it. Um, and so I thought, you know what, who am I going to talk to? I'm going to talk to Gabe. And uh, that's why I wanted to bring you on today. So again, thank you for coming on. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. Now, for those, um, I love questions. Questions are great ways for both Gabe and I to know what, what people want to hear. So if you do have a question, uh, feel free to use the Q&A button at the top. Uh, for some, it's going to be on the bottom. And we'll go ahead and answer your questions in real time as they pop up. Uh, so please send the questions in. I always say, if you've got a question, if you've got a question, there's probably someone else that's listening has got this very same question. And I know for myself, and I probably know for Gabe, we could talk about our, our industries forever and we can get into the weeds. So, um, so yes, bring those questions along. Um, as we get started, I just wanna make a quick disclaimer. This presentation is just for informational purposes only. We're not here to solicit, sell, or uh, it's not an offer to buy any type of security. Um, we're here just to provide information to you uh, and provide the knowledge that we have to you. Um, there are gonna be probably segments of this presentation that uh, put um, future plans, objective assumptions together. Um, again, uh, if you do invest with both Gabe or myself, um, Please do your own due diligence, speak with your professional, your attorney or your CPA or anyone else uh, that handles your affairs. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we've got a pretty simple webinar today. We're going to talk about uh, the Delaware Statutory Trust in just a minute. I'm going to go ahead and have um, Gabe jump on and talk about that. Uh, real quick, a quick bio on myself for those who don't know who I am. I am a graduate of the University of Michigan. 
Um, I've done coursework in real estate finance and accounting at UCSD. Uh, I started in actually real estate finance back in 2001. Gabe, I got to tell you, I'm starting to date myself now. Um, I mean, it, that's a long time ago. Just leave so, the dates out. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, spent uh, spent about five years with uh, Key Bank's private equity group. Spent another two years with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So I went around and was responsible for closing down banks that were failing in 2008. Had a great experience doing that. And then established my company today, Talamar Financial, in 2008. Currently live in San Diego. Got a beautiful wife and, and three beautiful kids. And uh, for those that don't know, I play competitive tennis. Yes, I get the question all the time. Do I play pickleball? The answer is no. But as I get a little older, I think I might be transitioning that way. So um, Talamar Financial, as many, some of you may be aware, we are a hard money lender here in San Diego. We specialize in financing, fix and flip loans, bridge loans, and whatnot. But a lot of people can invest alongside of us in our mortgage fund. And we'll talk a little about that after uh, Gabe gives his pres uh, presentation. So with that, Gabe, I'm going to hand it over to you, and I'm going to let you fly from here. So I'll go ahead and make you a host. Okay. I know we practice this, so. <laughs> Let's see how we do. All right. You should see my screen. I do. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you once again, Brock, for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you everyone who's joined the webinar. Um, uh, you know, our goal here is to make sure that you learn something. I promise that. Uh, possibly something that's useful or maybe even actionable. So, but either way, we promise you a good time or your money back. So, uh, <laughs> you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, me, my, my quick background for myself is going to be... Um, you know, something that over my experience and kind of knowledge of where we're at really kind of dived, you know, put me into this position of where we are and, and uh, what I do for a living is kind of really been set up nicely by my experience. I wasn't planning on this in my career, but it turns out that um, everything I've been through, it works out really well for 1031 exchanges and Delaware statutory trust. So going back all the way back to the seventies, my father came, my grandfather came to this country um, and realized that you can own private property. So the first thing he did was put together some family money and they bought a mixed use commercial. Um, what that meant was that my sister and I were running around the hallways while my grandpa, my father had his electrical contracting business in one of the offices. My, my aunt had her hair salon in the uh, retail spot and my uncle helped manage the apartment. So real estate's in my blood. Um, it was certainly dinner table talk. Fast forward. Uh, I went to, um, I, I was in Chicago. I went to DePaul University, got my finance degree there, um, moved out to uh, the West Coast. Someone told me to move out West, young man. So I did that. Um, move. Yeah, 2010. And so I moved in and worked for a um, countywide property management company, managed hundreds of units for uh, mostly apartments for uh, owners, really learned the fundamentals of how to work with uh, um investments, investment real estate, really at a fundamental kind of operational standpoint. Moved on shortly after that into multifamily sales. And so it's the thing about multifamily apartments is that it's strictly an investment property. You know, people aren't, people who own those properties aren't living in them. They're not running their businesses out of them. This is strictly investment real estate. And so what that meant for me, especially in San Diego, which is such a fantastic area to own investment real estate, especially apartments, um, there was not a lot of pain. There was not a lot of reasons for people to sell. And so I had to learn how, okay, listen, this is not about, you know, my marketing. This is not about any sales tactics. This is really about trying to figure out what the clients needed what they wanted and what their goals were and how I can better their position, which is really what I had to do. So I did all kinds of creative uh, deals such as uh, installment sales, uh, seller carrybacks, um, master leases, and of course, 1031 exchanges. And so even though, you know, this, this webinar was promoted as a kind of the basis of Delaware Statutory Trust, which we're going to get into, of course, the precursor is that it's very important to understand the best part of the Delaware Statutory Trust is that 1031 exchange. You know, that whole process is, is one of the best tax um, uh, sections of the entire code, in my opinion. So, all right, well, let's jump into it after that long first slide. Okay, so let me see if I can get my thing. Okay, so I have my own disclaimer. It's essentially the same as um, 
uh, Bronx, you know, we're not offering any securities today. Uh, we want to make sure that you review everything with your tax and legal specialist. And of course, always read your private placement memorandum. All right, introduction to Perch. Who is Perch in this world? You know, what we are, think of us as a broker of DSTs, okay? So what we do is we're an advisor, we're an advocate to the investor, to the client. Uh, we've done hundreds of successful exchanges. We've done over 100 uh, years of, expiring, of, of ex kind of combined experience. And we are industry experts. Honest, objective guidance. I want to hang on that for a second here. What that means is that some of you are familiar with 1031 exchanges. Probably even less of you are probably familiar with DSTs. Where you got that information is actually very important uh, if you're familiar with DSTs at all. Uh, what that means is that you may have heard it from a sponsor. You may have heard about it from uh, an, another broker. What we do is we're actually, um, we have 100% only interested in working with the investor. We don't, we don't work for the sponsors and we do not have any proprietary offerings on our side, on our, in our business. What that means is that we're not um, basically talking out of both sides of our mouth. So it's very important to know that we're an advocate for the client. Um, we're not, we're not the seller in, in this circumstance. So also extensive due diligence. Um, it's very important. A lot of people are saying, are trying to figure out, Hey, how, what do you know about these deals? Well, if you've been to the grocery store and you've seen uh, triple washed lettuce, this is pretty much the same thing. Uh, what happens first is the sponsor finds the deal. They do their due diligence. They want to make sure it's going to be a good deal. It's in their best interest. This is a very small industry uh, comparatively. And so they have uh, the best interest to make sure they do good deals. Otherwise, they're going to get wiped out um, in this market. So we want to make sure we're staying with good, good sponsors who are doing good deals. The deal do, then goes on to our uh, broker dealer who does their own due diligence and then finally gets to Perch Wealth, which we have our own analysts who we, we look at those deals um, are specifically on our own. To give you to kind of quantify that, what that means is that at any given time in the market, there's about 60 to 80 DSTs in the market. We only like about 10 to 15 of them. We have access to all of them. We probably only prefer uh, 10 to 15 of those. Okay, so quick agenda. You know, once again, we're going to talk about the IRS 1031, um, the do's and don'ts, and Delaware Statutory Trust, and then lastly, you know, the market environment of where we are and kind of how that's the perfect storm um, of where we're at in this market. Okay, so this is the part where I stop to applaud you all for coming to a IRS Section 1031 uh, Internal Revenue Code uh, presentation. So congratulations for you guys all making it. Um, do's and don'ts that we're going to get into here. What can you exchange? What can you not exchange? Okay. Almost all real estate is pretty much exchangeable as long as uh, the use is held for investment. So obviously commercial properties, apartments, land, um, but when even houses and condos, et cetera, are, can be exchanged as long as they're held for investment. So if you're living and you're occupying in the property, uh, that is not exchangeable. What can you exchange into? You cannot exchange into another personal residence. Um, and you cannot exchange into most other syndicated investments. So the DST is a syndicated investment that is 1031 eligible. The rest of them are typically not. So most people are aware of a real estate investment trust, also known as a REIT. Uh, you cannot exchange into those. Most of those REITs get calls from owners all the time saying, hey, I want to exchange into your REIT. Not achievable. The IRS does not allow it. Uh, you, know, Gabe, you bring up a good point on that. And, and I get a lot of calls for investors yep. for our mortgage fund um, that are trying to exchange funds. And unfortunately, you know, for us, we can't take those funds. They're not, they don't qualify for that 1031. That's why yep. I send them, I send them over to you. Yep. That's a good point. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's a distinction that the IRS, um, you know, we're in this world of what the IRS allows us to do and the benefits are great. But, you know, you have to stay within that box. Otherwise, they will disallow it. Um, you can't go into stocks and bonds and other limited partnerships as well. Okay, so more do's and don'ts. Uh, 1031 exchange. Most people are aware that you have to replace the value of the property that you sold. Well, other people do not uh, realize that you actually have to replace the debt and the equity uh, in those same amounts. Um, so what that means is that let's say you have a Closing that you sold the property for a million dollars, um, seven hundred fifty thousand of that was equity, two hundred fifty that was debt. You can't just move the seven fifty that you collected after the closing into your next property. You have to move the debt as well. Um, it doesn't have to be debt specifically. You can replace it with fresh equity, but you do have to replace those two different um, 
equity and debt amounts. To give you an example of what that looks like, if you don't replace it, it's called boot and boot is taxable. So we're trying to avoid boot when we're in a 1031 exchange. In this first scenario, client A has a million dollar sales price. Half of it was uh, equity at 500,000, half of it was debt. They went ahead and bought another per property for a million five. They put a million in uh, 500 in equity in it and 500 in debt. They, they were uh, satisfied the exchange and it worked out really well. The second one, client B, had an unsuccessful one with some boot. Now, there's two types of boot. There's equity boot, which means that uh, you didn't place all of your cash that you had from the exchange and you have to pay taxes on that cash that you received. The worst kind of boot is mortgage boot. And so that's the kind that where you paid the bank back and you still owe taxes. So at least with equity boot, you actually collected some money that you can actually pay taxes with. The second boot, that money is now gone and now you owe extra taxes. So in this scenario, they did not complete the million dollar exchange. They only bought a- how, how would you have thousand. that? Is How would you have that scenario? Is that someone that's owned the property for a long period of time, they keep refinancing and pulling the money out. And as a result, there's no tangible dollar return after paying off that debt? So good question. This, this example actually kind of shows you how you would do it. The, the, the sale scenario is the same. Um, so they sold the property for a million dollars and they had 500,000 of that was equity, 500,000 of that was debt. Their main issue is that they did not replace the million dollars of exchanged property. They only bought, in this example, they bought a property for 833,000. So what they did was they got a loan that was less than they had before. The previous yeah. loan they had was for half a million. They went and got a new loan at 333,000. And that's where they're, that's where they went wrong. What they should have done was get at least a half million dollar loan, or what they could have done was out of their back pocket, um, added another hundred and what is that going to be? $67, $67,000 to actually complete the exchange and get a full million dollars in the exchange. Okay. So that would be the part where, you, where this client screwed up. Okay. So moving on, you know, advanced planning is always important. And what that means is just some quick, some quick tidbits on exchanging, uh, the ownership structure is very important to consider when you're in a 1031. Um, I'll get calls all the time saying, yeah, I've got a LLC. I've got a partner in my LLC. We're going to think about exchanging. I want to go my way. He wants to go his way. If you're in an LLC, you have to keep that LLC in the exchange. So you won't be able to go your separate, way, separate ways. Um, important to consider that. If you're thinking about making a change, uh, definitely talk to your um, your legal and tax specialist on that. The IRS is starting to crack down on what they call um, drop and swaps, which are basically um, you know liquidating the LLC into partnership into different uh, single entities and then doing an exchange. So you know that's something you have to talk to your uh, your specialist about as well. Also, if there's one thing to know about from this whole entire um, presentation, if you're considering doing a 1031 and you're in escrow on your property, you have to engage your exchange accommodator before you sell. Um, I've gotten too many calls after the client has sold, collected the cash, and then says, you know, I want to do a 1031. At that point, it's a there, you're not allowed to do an exchange at that point. What you've done is you've taken constructive receipt of that cash and you've kind of blown your, your chances at an exchange. So if anything, make sure you talk to a QI, a qualified intermediary, also known as an exchange accommodator which I'll get into in a second. Uh, those are the people that are gonna help kind of make sure you have that second escrow in the process. Um, and then always obviously evaluate the kind of properties that you wanna exchange into as your replacement property. Okay, so QI, once again, they're like the escrow of your, the second escrow of your property. They're the ones that hold the money while you look for your trade property. They help you with timeline management, identification, um, and kind of help you with that whole process. Um, understanding the process that, you know, this is kind of a confusing chart, but basically what you would do is you'd sell your property. The cash would go to the QI, the QI. Once you find your second property, that cash would go straight to the seller of your second property. And then you would collect that property as your exchange. And that would kind of complete the trade. All right. So timeline and identification process, you know, the timeline is what stresses most people out when it comes to a 1031. Uh, this is the part that it stresses them out so much, just the thought of it, that they actually stay away from even doing a 1031, which is unfortunate because there's really a lot of ways, and this is what we're going to get into later, 
um, to make sure that you have a completed exchange and you're not going to blow your exchange. Um, that's where we come in to help strategize, identify, and execute on those replacement properties so it's not as bad. Um, and there's, it's for good reason why it's, it's kind of stressful. You only have 45 days from the closing of your property to actually identify um, a number of properties to exchange into. 45 days is not a lot of time. Um, you really can't go hunting with a loaded weapon until you have closed on your down leg property. Um, so you're probably not gonna get an offer accepted before you close. Uh, once you get an offer submitted, you know, it might take you a week or so um, to get accepted. If you get accepted, you have you know weeks and weeks of different uh, due diligence items to take care of. Uh, it's gonna be physical due diligence, title review, legal review. It goes on environmental sometimes. And then obviously uh, financing, if you have to do financing, could take quite a long time. In, a, in the commercial world, you know, 45 days minimum for even a maybe. So uh, the, the confidence level of where you're at at the end of a 45-day period to try to buy a property direct um, can be quite low at the end of your 45 days. So you're kind of crossing your fingers at that point. You do have 180 days from the time of closing to actually close. So that is usually not an issue, um, but uh, that gives you some more time at least. Okay, how can you identify? Most people aren't aware there's actually multiple ways of identifying replacement properties, different rules. Most people are aware of the three property rule. So if you wanna sell a property and identify any three properties, regardless of value, you can identify the Empire State Building if you wanted to. Um, it does not matter, any three properties. Um, but the one that most people aren't aware of is the 200% rule. So that's the one we use a lot with DSTs because a lot of our DSTs are portfolios of properties. It could have as much as you know, 10 to 30 different properties in one DST. So we'll have to get outside the three property rule into the 200% rule. And the rule is very simple. So whatever you, whatever value you purchased or you sold your last property for, you can only um, have an aggregate full number of 200% on of your uh, the one you sold. So if you sold a million dollar property, you can name as many properties as you like, as long as all of them don't add up to more than 200% or 2 million in this scenario. So um, with DSTs, it's actually quite simple. Um, last one, most people don't use, um, it's rare. It's called the 95% rule. You can name as many properties as you like, but you have to uh, you have to close on all of them. So if you're looking to purchase a portfolio of properties um, above three properties, that one is gonna be good if you're planning on closing on all you know, over three properties. Okay, so 1031 exchange benefits. We just kind of went over the do's and don'ts, but what we haven't talked about is why would you want to do a 1031? And the answer is very simple. It's tax deferral, okay? So a lot of people who have owned properties for quite some time or have done some value add projects and really increased the value, um, their basis is going to be quite low. And that's how you calculate um, your, your capital gain. And so if your basis is low and you sold it for a much higher market value, uh, you're going to have quite a big uh, capital gain to consider and your taxes could be significant. So deferring those taxes and still keeping um, your full principal value in the market with a new property is actually very attractive. So when we're talking about taxes, what kind of taxes are we talking about? Well, um, probably most of us are in California. Um, so we have the uh, uh, fortunate uh, trophy of highest uh, income tax in the country. 13.3 uh, is what it says here. I think it just might have went up to 13.8 recently, unfortunately. Um, so we have 20% long-term capital gains federal. We have the newer uh, net investment income tax at 3.8. We have 25% depreciation recapture. This is another one people forget about. If you depreciated your property over the last 10, 20, 30 years, that amount that you depreciated, which was great, your, 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 your tax accountant probably loved it, during the time that you're collecting income and reducing that by depreciation. But if you actually were to, pay, to collect those taxes, 25% um, of what you depreciated is what you'd have to pay back. So if it's a million dollars in depreciation, you'll owe about 250 grand, mm -hmm. which is pretty, pretty significant. People forget about that one all the time. Now I've got a question, Gabriel, on that back on that slide back to you. So two questions. I know you've been heavily involved in investing personally and, and representing people on buying and selling apartment buildings. Um, how does does this new law in Los Angeles, this new rule that they set up that there's a five percent the mansion tax, tax 
luxury tax on real estate over, I think, is it 5 million? 5 million, yeah. 5 million. Does, can this get you out of that? Uh, so the so that mansion tax, which I just talked to a guy yesterday um, who's in New York, who's in New York also has had a mansion tax for quite some time. Okay. Um, that will not that will um, that tax, which I haven't done a lot of research on, I believe is on the property. So if okay. I think you would, it would not move forward, you would not be deferring that tax. Okay. Uh, but I think you would if you moved outside of that state or that area. Uh, I think you would get outside that. So that's a good question. I have to do a little more research on that since we're not in LA. I haven't really been focusing on it, but um, okay. the, what the gentleman from yesterday I spoke to who's from New York said that you would not be subject to that. And then the other thing that always has popped up is accelerated depreciation. So we now know in the new tax laws that you can accelerate depreciation on, on the physical hard asset of, of whatever you're purchasing, apartment building, you can so you can you can accelerate that. So have you seen an increase in 1031 exchanges as people are just buying and popping between between real estate, getting that accelerated depreciation? Yeah, great question. Um, so yeah, accelerated depreciation is a number of ways. A lot of people with apartment buildings will do what's called a cost segregation, and that accelerates it, you know. You can do, I think, for most of it, 100% in the first year. So what that does is, you know, it's great for using that depreciation and you can actually use it across a number of your passive investments. So it doesn't have to be on that property alone. You can actually spread that yeah, that kind of air quote loss um, over another other properties. But what ends up happening is that, you know, in the short term, it's great. It's great for sheltering income. Um, but what ends up happening, like you're mentioning, is that it's going to push more people into 1031s because they're going to lower their basis significantly. Mm -hmm. And the lower, the faster you lower your basis, the more capital gain you can have in the future mm -hmm. or in the near term. And so it's going to put you to more, um, it's going to actually point you more in the direction of a 1031 to keep moving that tax uh, liability forward. Okay. And you might get into this. So I got one more, qu another question here. Go for it. What are your thoughts long term on 1031s? I may have just completely skipped to the end of your conversation. No, that's fine. That's fine. Where, uh, where are we going with 1031s? I know there's been some pressure about eliminating this 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 kind of tax loophole. Uh, so what happens is that every single year they go after the 1031. They've been going after the 1031 for a very long time, mm -hmm. and it's in the news, you know, uh, a little heavier here and there. But and it actually got pretty close to some type of action the last time we had this election, but. Um, what ended up happening is they were talking about limiting the amount that you can 1031 or tax defer. Um, at one point it was a million dollars and actually went down to about 500,000. Okay. So if you've got, you know, a few million dollars in an exchange, um, that could be, um, that can be a major issue yeah, um, be. for the amount that you can defer. It ended up falling apart um, in Congress. Uh, fortunately, you know, like I said, they kind of always go after it and then they kind of always back off. So, um, I don't know what the future is going to hold, but you know, one way. But to it's available of, now. Take advantage. It's available now. It's certainly available now. And kind of jumping forward to DSTs is that you know one of the things that could be a good strategy that some of our clients are doing is that if they do limit it to five hundred thousand or a million dollars a year in in, in deferred taxes, um, some people are exchanging now into DSTs in chunks of five hundred thousand. If it's a, oh, if they have a they have a five or ten million dollar exchange. They'll probably do a number of DSTs at around five hundred thousand, and if they start to cycle in different years, you can mm -hmm. actually have um, hit that limit without really going over it over those years. So that's a good strategy to kind of consider for a DST as well. Um, if yeah. you do see that, because they're going to limit it, they're not going to re remove it completely, most likely, um, or I should say, hopefully. And Gabe, that's why I always refer back to you on these kinds of questions. Yeah, you know, there's a few <laughs> strategies to consider, but. They do always go after it and it always gets a little scary, but yeah, you know, at the same time, they always, someone finally tells these Congress people that they actually own commercial real estate too. And they say, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> okay. So, all right. So once again, this is kind of explaining how that depreciation works. Um, let's say you bought a property for 600,000, 10, 20 years ago, and now someone just wrote you an offer for 1.8. And you're saying, well, gosh, maybe I want to take that offer. Well, it turns out that over that 20 year period, your accountant has been depreciating it and you depreciated it down to zero. That's, a, that's called adjustable cost basis. Um, so the way the government looks at that is they say, you know what? The IRS looks at that and says, well, your entire gain is 1.8. 1.8 minus zero is 1.8. Um, that turns into a hefty uh, tax bill. And this shows you what that tax bill looks like. Um, so in the first scenario, if you decided to pay the taxes, 
it goes out and lists all those taxes, 20% federal, state tax, uh, net investment income tax, depreciation recapture tax, um, total taxes on a 1.8 purchase or sale, I should say, is about $700,000. That's a that's a hard check to write, I, I got to imagine for most people. Uh, you'll end up with about 1.1 out of a $1.8 million sale, not including you know, closing costs and commissions and all that. So the next scenario is obviously doing a 1031 and you got zero, 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 you've deferred all those taxes and you still have 1.8 million to invest and reinvest. And that's where, that's the power of what we're talking about here. And, you know, when it comes to 1.8 investing, it's you're obviously not just deferring the capital gains. The flip side of that is having greater purchasing power. So now you get to go out in the market with 1.8 instead of 1.1. And if you're looking for cash flow, that's going to give you some more cash flow potentially. So that's what you're looking for. Other parts of the 1031 that are desirable is obviously diversifying. Most people aren't aware you actually can go into a number of different properties, not just one. Uh, you can go into other real estate markets. And our goal here is to just you know seek to obviously build wealth, but also preserve it. And in this market, we're trying to be very conservative. A lot of our clients would like a, a return on their money, but more importantly, like return of their money. Okay, so Delaware Statutory Trust, terrible, terrible name, um, but it's a great solution for most people. And when it comes to DSTs, which is going to be our short form here, you know, you know, Delaware, it's, it's one of those states that you may not know much about. Um, in fact, you probably know so little about that you didn't realize this is not Delaware. This is Delaware. Um, it's one of those small I still states. laugh at that. I still laugh at that. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> It's hard to tell on a webinar because I don't get any feedback, but hopefully some of them. And I do have investors from the East Coast, and I probably should know. That. <laughs> That's funny for everybody who, who's not from Delaware. Uh, okay, so DST, what does that mean, Delaware Statutory Trust? Well, first of all, it doesn't have the property does not have to be in Delaware, fortunately. Um, it's strictly a business trust out of Delaware. Um, it, it has an IRS ruling from 2004. It's fairly new. So 2004, when the IRS decided, you know what, this is a syndicated investment that will allow people to do a 1031 exchanges into. And the real reason is because it's fairly conservative and the structure works out really well um, for owners. And I'm gonna get into that conservative part a little bit later. Um, but what can you do with a, with, a, with a DST structure? You can own fairly almost any commercial property that runs the full gamut of triple net, multifamily, industrial, office, self-storage, and many others. So um, you can put a lot of different properties in the DST structure. And uh, we do have a ruling from the IRS that allows you to do a 1031. What are some of the advantages of a 1031? Well, first and foremost, it's an easy button um, to really think about it that way. A lot of our clients are trying to go from active management to passive management and passive income. So if you're kind of sick of the three T's in apartment re rental management, you know, it's going to be tenants, toilets and trash. Uh, they kind of want to move on to, you know, kind of retiring in their investment life cycle. This is certainly an easy button. It's going to get away from all the management, just collect those mailbox checks and it could work out really well. However, that does not mean it's a bad investment in any way. This, in fact, this is kind of the perfect storm we're going to get into later on that this DST in this market right now is working out very well for a lot of people. And it's kind of opening our range of investors from the ones who just want to go from active to passive to ones who are also looking for, for cash flow. Um, because right now there's a lot of deals that are upside down when it comes to the cap rates, the kind of the return on investment versus the interest rate, which is significantly higher for a lot of markets and a lot of investment properties. So that's eating up majority of the cash flow, if not eliminating it completely. And a lot of people will question, if, well, if I'm, if I'm not gonna get any cash flow, then why am I doing all of this? Um, and if I'm in a place where I've had a property for 10, 20, 30 years, you know, that cash flow at, at that point in my life is probably very important. I'm actually looking forward to that cash flow. Um, and the reality is most people have spoken to their, 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 their CPAs and accountants, and they've made the decision that they're not going to touch that equity. They said, you know what? I realize that later on, once I pass and I give this, these assets to my heirs, I'll get what's called a stepped up in basis. And that basis that we talked about earlier goes to market value. You know, so earlier we talked about a $1.8 million sale. If you pass that on to your heirs, and they sold it for 1.8, and the basis was 1.8, 1.8 minus 1.8 is zero. So you have zero taxable liability. Um, so that's where a lot of people have decided for their estates, for their legacy, for their heirs, they're trying to do the best financial decision they can. And a lot of times that means that they're going to um, not cash out and pay those taxes. And so if you're not going to do that, 
that means that those clients have decided that, you know what, if I'm not going to touch the equity, I might as well maximize the cash flow. And so that's really what we're trying to do here is maximize the cash flow, max and make sure we, we hold on to that um, and preserve that wealth and preserve that equity. So what is a DST? A DST has got a great turnkey replacement property solution. So these are um, institutional quality assets. Uh, you know, institutional is one of those words that gets thrown around a lot. Um, in this scenario, what it means is that we're talking about values of property, typically between 50 and $100 million um, all over the country. Uh, the players for these types of properties are going to be pension accounts, uh, insurance companies, university endowment funds. You'll probably read an article, you know, two or three times a year about how great some of these endowment funds have been doing because they've been buying these properties for, for many years and many decades, and it's worked out very well for them. Um, so we're kind of jumping into that same marketplace and getting the same scale and, and, uh, and benefits as they do. So once again, passive management, passive income. You're not going to be asked to, to help out with any of the management or do any of that. You're just going to collect those, um, those mailbox checks and, and enjoy that. One of the great things about DSTs, too, is you get a low minimum investment. So a lot of the DSTs will have a low minimum as low as $100,000. So if you have a $500 to a $1 million exchange, you know, it's a good chance we can probably do two to five, six different DSTs in that exchange which kind of leads to the next one, which is diversification. So you can actually diversify by not just asset class, but also location and then sponsor too. So multiple layers of diversification. And going back to what we said earlier about, you know, those 1031s, if you have to replace debt, we have DSTs that are all cash and we have some that are leveraged. And so if you're looking to replace debt, we can actually check off that box that we have leverage on the property. And the great thing is that you're not going into the bank to help qualify for that loan. Uh, the loan is already on the property. It's only against the property and there's not recourse to the investor as well. Lastly is the estate planning portion of this. So, you know, estate planning wise, which I talked about earlier, um, you still get those stepped up in basis. You still do a 1031, um, but you can also try to, you know, look at it from a different angles. I have one client that decided to do three different DSTs and in their trust said, um, I want each DST to go to one of my three children. And so you can kind of split it up that way. If you don't think they're going to play nice together, you can say, when I pass, this one's yours, that one's yours, that one's yours. The other way to think about it too, is that, you know, it's kind of funny. I've talked to a lot of investors over the years and some of them don't have a lot of trust and faith in their, some of their kids when it comes to financial decisions. Uh, so they'll say, you know, I enjoy that you know, these cycles that we'll get into a little bit later, you know, can last about five to seven years for these DST cycles. If I pass in the middle of that, you know, I'm actually looking forward to my kids having that stable income for quite yeah. some time and it actually, you know, make them think about what their next investments. You can't just be. take all the money and go to Vegas with it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, going back to, you know, my history in multifamily brokerage, if someone passed, you know, that property was probably sold 90, 89% chance it was probably sold in the first six months. Yeah. And I just got to imagine that, you know, a lot of new cars were, were bought and new homes. I kind of laugh uh, because, you know, there, you've got <laughs> these, these parents that spent their entire lifetime building this portfolio of, of beautiful real estate. And then within yeah, six months, completely liquidated. It's gone. Yeah. Yeah. And they were, and they were, you know, slaving over, making sure that, you know, the light bulbs were all fixed and the grass was cut and everything else. And then it's a fire sale. Um, so yeah, this is kind of a nice way to say, you know, Hey, you're going to enjoy this income. Um, yeah. You don't need that new car, et cetera. It's another way to think about it from a different angle. Okay. So restrictions and limitations, you know, DSTs are not for everybody. And so here are some of the reasons why it may not be for you. Uh, they are a liquid. So once again, you know, real estate in general is a liquid asset. Um, this is not like a stock or a bond, even though it's a security, you can't buy it at nine o'clock in the morning and sell it at two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, most of these uh, cycles are averaging between five and seven years, which once again, my clients have decided that I'm never going to touch this equity. So another five or seven years is not um, a big deal. Um, there is no secondary market for these. So whatever someone else tells you, um, that is not the case. You can technically sell your interest, um, but I'll be the first to tell you that there is no secondary market. Um, the flip side of having passive income and passive management is that you have no control. Um, so the, the sponsor who is the trustee of the trust, they're the ones who kind of manage the property and take care of it, making sure that they're a good steward of the property for their investors. Um, and they have good reason to do that because uh, they want to make sure they do another DST afterwards. So if they do well, they have a good track record, 
um, they'll get to do more and more DSTs. And we have client, we have sponsors that have been doing it for 15 years and treat their investors well. Um, but they do have full control. And so for some of our clients, they say, you know, I got to have that control. DST may not be the right choice for you. But my que- my next question usually is why? You know, you want to sell it when the market's down? Is that what you're trying to do? <laughs> so what do you need the control for? Yeah. Um, you know, and then lastly, you know, when the DST is sold and it goes full cycle, you're back in the same position as you were before. So you're going to be back into the position of you can either do another 1031 into a DST. You can do a 1031 into a direct uh, real estate property. Maybe you want to buy a fourplex in the next five years. You can do that again or obviously pay the taxes and take the cash. OK, seven deadly sins of DSTs. You know, the, the IRS doesn't call it this, but we certainly do. Um, you know, there's a few of them that we'll just get into right now. And this is the kind of part where it makes it very conservative for a lot of these DSTs. Um, you know, the property that's in the DST cannot be sold out of that DST and you can't swap it for anything else. So you're not going to be worried about, you know, you know, a lot of these REITs will have properties going in and out of the REIT. And depending on those decisions of what they sold and what they bought, that could affect the value of the REIT. Um, in this scenario, you know, you're actually locked into that property. Um, when that sells, you're going to be liquidating, and which means you can go into another 1031. Um, so you can actually look forward to just saying, I can analyze this property myself and look at what the pro forma is going to be. The other limitation on these is that you're not allowed to renegotiate debt. Um, so that means all the all the debt structures and all the ones that have debt are very long term. I'm talking seven to 10 years fixed fixed uh, fixed terms and fixed interest rates. Oh, I didn't know so, that. Okay. Yeah. So because you're not allowed to renegotiate it. So they'll typically sell before that uh, loan terms comes up. So you just eliminated financing risk um, with that scenario. Uh, so you're also no, not, you, you can never refinance the the, lo- you, the initial loan that you went into that transaction. There's no refinancing it. No, they'll have to sell it before then. So if they get a 10 year loan, they're looking to get out of there in the next five to seven years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if the market's not good in five years, they'll say, you know, what? we got a cash flowing asset. Yeah. We have fixed financing and um, let's hold on to it for another couple of years and mm-hmm. just get out of this in the good market and give ourselves you know, plenty of time to uh, to move on that. Um, so yeah, the financing is fixed, which is a good, which is good news. Um, everyone's concerned about financing these days. Um, next is going to be no capital calls. So they can't, you know, if you put a hundred thousand dollars into a DST this year, you know, they can't call you next year and say, Hey, we want to put a new pool house in. So we're going to ask everybody for 20 grand, not allowed to do that. And so that's where they have to have reserves. And so you get, they'll, they'll pad a pretty good reserve account. Um, for most of these, uh, DST. Now, question on that. Can the sponsor bring in more money? Or would that dilute the share? I mean, does that dilute the, the ownership interest in all the other DST investors? You know, it's a good question. I think I, I haven't had that issue before. You know, yeah. they have reserves for these accounts. So okay. um, that hasn't been an issue, but I'll look into that for you to see if that's something they can do for you. Um, next is going to be uh, no no major capital um, um, improvements. So you're not you're not going to see any deals for DSTs. They're they're going to buy land and they're going to build you know townhouses and all this. Yeah. There there is no uh, these are all going to be you know mostly going to be newer construction or newly rehabbed properties without a yeah. lot of uh, um, capital improvements uh, to be kind of considered. And that's one of the things you know I talk about from a trust deed or mortgage fund standpoint is that we really stay away from construction loans. There's just too much risk associated exactly. with that, and I can't imagine doing a yeah, and putting 1031 funds into a construction loan because you just, you know, there's so many uh, variables that go in and issues that can arise. And yeah, so and what we're, we're talking about here is, yeah, you're, you're removing financing risk, you're removing, yeah. um, you know, market risk of what those, you know, townhouses would be would be built, you know, you know uh, mm-hmm. worth when they're new and removing any capital improvement costs and all that. So you're, you're kind of removing a lot of issues, you know, labor force, all that. Um, so you're kind of looking at this as a kind of a straight, you know, um, you know, kind of a commodity side of real estate, if you will. OK, so if someone came to me and says, Gabe, I got a million dollars, I'd like to see what my options are with a DST. You know, I might say, you know, hey, let's put together a custom portfolio. And so some some questions I get are, you know, would this be a DST with all these different asset classes in one DST? Not likely. The reality is you're trying to prepare this for a sale in the future. And let's say there's a certain pension accounts or endowment funds or, or uh, 
insurance companies that say, you know, I got to own multifamily. They're only going to want to buy a multifamily DST. They're not going to want to buy, you know, multifamily with self-storage and assisted living and all that. So what we do is we actually customize it ourselves and kind of create our own little mutual fund of real estate all over the country. And so if someone said, hey, I got a million dollars, what should I do? I might say, hey, let's take 250 of that and put it into multifamily. In this case, it's 300 units, class A plus, newly constructed in, in Tennessee. Um, it's got 10 year financing um, fixed and you know it's got, uh, let's say 40% debt. That might help with someone's debt coverage there. So that's multifamily. Uh, the next one could be another 250 into assisted living. Um, in this case, it's in Atlanta, Georgia. Assisted living is one of our favorite asset classes right now because just where the demographics are going, mm -hmm. the average person in assisted living is 74 years old. The oldest baby boomer is 76 years old. That entire generation is now becoming candidates for assisted living. And if you think we have a problem with housing in, in general in this country, we have a really a real big issue with supply of housing, of assisted living housing when it comes to um, this asset class. It's a, it's a great asset class. A lot of clients are going to be there, and a lot of them are actually pretty financially secure, uh, which puts them in a good position for assisted living as well. Uh, the next one is, is triple net. So the, I love triple net. Triple net's an option for a lot of people in a 1031 where they can go buy direct. Once again, million dollar example. If you had a million dollars, there's a good chance you could probably find a triple net somewhere in the country that's going to be uh, attainable at that price point. However, I don't like single um, triple net properties. I like baskets of triple nets. I like portfolios of triple nets. Um, so these were, so the portfolios that we have are actually going to include some pretty big boys when it comes to, you know, these properties are probably worth $20 million each. Walmart, Walgreens, CVS, um, the list goes on. And we can kind of diversify more risk by having a whole diversified portfolio, uh, which is quite nice as well. The last one was, let's say, let's do self-storage, portfolio of self-storage. It could be, you know, in South Florida or in this case, Charleston. Uh, self-storage is probably one of the most uh, recession resilient asset classes out there. So we want to make sure we're staying in this kind of conservative, resilient, because we're not really big on what we're going to see here in the future. Okay, so we've got a great- Real quick, just for my investors, what is triple net? Can you quickly explain what that is? Of course. It's uh, It means net, net, net. So okay. uh, it means net of, so it's a lease, it's a lease term. So in the case of a Walmart or a Walgreens, mm -hmm. you are you can buy that property. Someone is allowed to buy the property. Walgreens and Walmart made a decision as a corporation that they don't want to own real estate. Okay. They only want to lease real estate. Okay. And they'll do very long leases because when was the last time you saw a Walmart or a Walgreens move? Yeah. Right? You know, they rarely move. Yeah. So they'll sign a 20-year lease with the property owner. Okay. And they'll say, you know what? We're going to pay you X amount per month. And by the way, we're going to take care of the taxes, we're going to take care of the insurance, and we're going to take care of the maintenance. So those are the three nets. So it's a lease payment that is net of property taxes, net of insurance, net of maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a very, um, it's a great passive investment. Like I said, most people in 1031 who are trying to go from active to passive are considering 1031, are considering triple nets. Okay. My, once again, my issue is that you're going from one, all your eggs in one basket into all your eggs into another basket. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not exactly, um, it's a pretty, it's a pretty safe conservative investment. Once again, Walmart, Walgreens, these are major corporate, yeah. national corporate um, companies. Um, so you can feel pretty good about them paying the tenant, paying the rents. However, it's not foolproof. I mean, really during COVID, you know, Starbucks wasn't paying their tenants for a while and that was Starbucks. Um, and so what, you know, what, what could happen is they might look at the, the property owner and say, oh, okay, the Smith family trust owns this property. You know, maybe we can bully them and just say, we're not going to pay you. And what, what, what are you going to do against Starbucks? You know, you can call your lawyer and say, let's sue Starbucks. I mean, I suppose you can, but you know, if, if you're going to work with one of these companies, the sponsors, once again, these are most likely billion dollar companies. They don't just offer DSTs. A lot of these have their own REITs. They have their own um, limited partnerships and funds. These guys have been around the business a long time. Their valuations are usually over a billion dollars and they can push back essentially if if Starbucks starts messing with them and saying, I'm yeah. not going to pay you. Um, so it's nice to have um, that as well on top of the diversification when it comes to a triple net. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And of course, you know, when I do a, a custom portfolio, I send over a presentation just like the one you're seeing today and it gives you some more specifics on, you know, what that, 
first year targeted income is going to be, what the average is going to be, what your cash flow is going to be. You know, most often, you know, we're looking at probably four to six percent on average for cash flow. And that's not including the appreciation potential as well. So I have a client that just sold, um, just came out of a DST that they were in for about four or five years. They put 100,000 in, they, they came out about 150,000 and they were collecting income the entire time. So that's a pretty good, pretty good example of a DST. And I'm sorry, did you cover that? Do you get to take the depreciation? You do. Yeah. So depreciation is passed through. Okay. Uh, you are one of the investors in the property. Mm -hmm. And so um, depreciation on real estate, uh, either a straight line depreciation, if it's a commercial property, or um, a lot of the multifamily DSTs um, will have a cost segregation that we kind of got into earlier, where they'll do an accelerated depreciation and give that all to you to shelter uh, most of that income, if not move it on to other assets that you might have. Gabe, um, that's pretty nice. Looks like we had a couple of questions come in. The first question, I'm going to wait until Gabe uh, talk about returns and that type of stuff, expectation levels till the end. But um, one of the questions came in that asked, um, if you're exchanging from a property where you have no debt, can you exchange into a property and pick up some leverage? So imagine, I imagine the question is buying it cash and then taking money out. Absolutely, you can. You absolutely can. A lot of our clients will do that on purpose because when you pick up debt, that means you're actually adding value. So once again, let's say, Going back to the million dollar example, you sold the property for a million dollars, all cash, no debt. Mm. And then you put it into a property that has 50% leverage. That would actually put you into a $2 million property. So a million dollars of equity, a million dollars of debt, that's 50% LTV. Okay. Uh, what you just did was you just bought a $2 million property. Now you have $2 million worth of depreciation. So okay. a lot of people actually will do that on purpose to pick up more depreciation. Oh, interesting. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's a very good question, actually. Now, hold on, but you can't go back lower debt. Is that the rule? You So you can. Uh, you're just going to have to pay taxes on the boot. On the boot. That's what so, we you know, some clients will tell me, hey, you know, I got a million dollar exchange. I'm going to invest 800000 and take two hundred off the table. Yeah, you know, yeah. I want yeah. I I to have some cash. Yeah. But, you know, keep in mind and talk to your accountant, uh, you know, typically those taxes are off the top. So a majority of those taxes will be paid out of the two hundred. Um, so, so you're better off taking leverage, buying up and maybe re-leveraging that property to can't take a cash out. That's something I would certainly consider. Yeah. I would certainly yeah. consider buying all cash and then refinancing later. Yeah. Uh, you'll still be within, within. And then you're uh, not paying tax on the, on the boot. You're not paying taxes. Yeah. I would much rather do that scenario than pay the tax. And, you know, yeah. if there isn't, I don't know if there's any scenario where I suggest paying the tax. <laughs> 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 like that's a smart, smart idea. Especially if you can get a step up basis um, okay. for, your, for your estate. Okay. So once again, multiple layers of diversification. So we have uh, a by asset class, multifamily, self-storage, triple net. You can diversify by sponsor and diversify by location. And to kind of wrap it up here, um, you know, what is the perfect storm today for DSTs? Well, when it comes to real estate values, you know, we're long-term outlook. We're, we're always, we're always bullish on real estate in the short term. We're not with where interest rates are at. Um, it's a high interest rate environment. And, you know, what happens with the, you know, I talked about before a lot of deals are upside down right now. And uh, if you're looking for a property that has a low return on investment and a high interest rate, it's probably going to eliminate most, if not all that cash flow. These DSTs were put together usually about three to six months ago, which was a lifetime ago when it comes to interest rates. So they have um, cash flowing DSTs that uh, could be a good choice for you if you're in a 1031 exchange. And the demographic trends right now, a lot of people are trying to go from active to passive, um, especially with California rent control laws and all kinds of other issues that people are dealing with. They might be telling themselves, you know what, I want to kind of get out of this and go into a, maybe a, a landlord friendly state uh, with someone else managing that property. And once again, the, the, the challenge of the traditional exchange, which was the 45 days, 45 days to get all your ducks in a row and feel very confident. You know, I, I'll, I'll talk to people who say, oh, yeah, I've already, I'm already passed contingencies. I've already decided on, on buying it, et cetera. And the next question I would ask is I say, you know what, your confidence level is high. However, has the seller signed the grant deed? Oh, no, he's going to do that later. OK, that's one last risk that you can encounter. And I've had clients that had you know, um, sellers that didn't sign the grant deed. And next thing you know, you're going to court, obviously, but guess what? You're paying taxes in the meantime. 
Dave, I just had a couple of more questions that popped up. So go ahead. First question here is um, looking at your three property portfolio in Maryland, Kansas, and South Carolina, are you required to pay state taxes in each of those localities, i.e. file tax returns in each one of those states? Yes. If it's not a tax-free state, you will have to pay taxes um, in that state. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. Um, also, if you're in California, California wants their fair share too. So even if it's a tax-free state and that income comes to you in California, um, you have to talk to your accountant about how that's going to be taxed here locally. Oh, but yeah, in, so, in that state, they're going to collect their income tax as well. So we want to make sure we're looking at, if that's a concern for you and you want to shelter income, you want to look at different asset classes like multifamily and see if they have a cost segregation study that might help with uh, sheltering that income. Okay. And then the next question is, can you do a 1031 exchange into a property out of the country? No, no. Uh, the 1031 has been around for over 100 years, give or take um, it, the way they, they named it. Um, and for very good reason, it's, it's, uh, it's a great wealth builder, but it also creates a lot of jobs and actually spurs the economy. But they're only giving that benefit to keeping that money in the U.S. It's actually one of the main reasons why they actually created the, the 1031. They did not want people to sell assets and move it out of the country. Oh, interesting. Uh, so they give, you a, they give you a tax break because they want that money here. in our Keep economy. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So just to wrap it up here, you know, this is the last slide. Um, you know, if you haven't heard about DSTs, it's, it's for good reason. They have not been around very long. Um, they kind of came in right before the crash of 2008. Um, they were popular before then, but then they kind of sputtered out, obviously. You know, it's not a big market. You know, five years ago, it was a billion dollar market. Um, that is relatively very small um, in terms of real estate. And it's been doubling ever since. Once again, good reason, a lot of demand, a lot of good reasons for DSTs. Um, last year was a $7 billion market. Uh, this year is on track for 10 or, or 10 or $12 billion market. Um, just to give you some more perspective, the entire market for 1031s is about 60 to 70 billion. Wow. The entire real estate market in terms of transactions every year is in the trillions. So mm -hmm. uh, this is still relatively small. Um, there's only about 30 to 35 sponsors in the market. Uh, and, you know, our job is to, once again, make sure the ones that we like work with the ones that we think are going to treat their investors well and manage the property well as well. So um, small market, great option, great opportunity, and it's growing and a good choice for a lot of investors in the 1031. And that's it. Awesome. So another question came in here. Um, so Here's the, 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 the big question that everyone I want to ask. Um, what is the typical return on cash, excluding my capital gains, on DST investments? Typically, it'd be about 4 to 6% cash on cash. Okay. And that range is going to be de determined by typically the asset class. So what I mean by that is that right now, multifamily is one of the most desirable asset classes. Uh, everyone's got to live somewhere. And so if we're heading into a rough market here, recession-wise, uh, housing is a fantastic place to be in, um, does not rely as much on the business community. And so the demand is so strong, it's pushing a lot of the income um, distributions down. And yeah. so you're, so you're going to see distributions for multifamily in the fours, you know, possibly even in the threes, mm -hmm. but also going to have more potential for appreciation, um, which is which is one of the parts of, uh, of, of multifamily that you might see. So I believe with interest rates rising, I think that there is going to be a push to increase returns to investors. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm interested to see kind of what the numbers are looking like on these, on these investments um, here in the next quarter to see if in order to raise capital for them, they're going to have to increase the returns. I mean, we're seeing that in the, in the debt market where the returns have, have just skyrocketed. And so, um, and because the demand from the investor is, look, we want a higher return for the perceived risk. So we'll, absolutely we'll two things about that. If I can, if I can chime in two yeah, things, yeah. one is, um, absolutely. You're right. Investor demand is going to require some more income. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, these sponsors are going to start when they're purchasing and start pushing back saying, you know, our interest rates too high. We're, we're the demand, we're the investor, right? We're yeah. going to want a higher return. And so to see how that plays out in the future is going to be interesting. Um, but once again, we're dealing with DSTs today that were put together three to six months ago. And so mm -hmm. those are 
those are already in place. And so that whole conversation of debt versus uh, return is, is no longer applicable because that's just what the options are. Yeah. Secondarily, you know, think about it this way. This is the 1031 market. The 1031 market is kind of at arm's length from the rest of the investor market. If I've got 100 grand right now in a place, I, I'm, yeah. I'm probably going to talk to you, Brock. Yeah. Um, and so I'm going to be looking for a certain amount of return because I have a lot of options. And there's yeah. a lot of options today that are changing pretty pretty quickly. You know, We're seeing a lot of bank savings rates go up, et cetera. Um, and so that's going to be changing things. And all of a sudden, 4% doesn't sound too great. However, yeah. think about the 1031 market where, once again, we're really talking about preserving all that principle. And so 4% on full principle is a lot better than paying 30, 45% in taxes yeah. and then trying to go look for more money. Um, get back up to where you were on that principal amount. You're going to have to be taking some big risks. You're going to have to be trying to get to a level that's going to, it's going to take you a while just to get back to square one. And we're, so we're, we're about focusing that, on deferring taxes. This, is, deferring this taxes. is what are you willing to pay to defer 50% capital gains? If exactly. You're in California? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So Interesting. you have that's to, you have to do that little bit of a, of a nuanced kind of a calculation on what the investment market is and what the 1031 market is. Yeah. What, you know, what the goals and, are. You know, 1031, really. you know, it's funny you say that because people, I, I mean, even today I was talking to an investor and they said, well, Brock, you know, why are you, why would a borrower who's bankable, good cash flow and whatnot, want to come to you for a loan, you know, at, at 10, 11, 12%? And the answer is very that. They have a 1031 exchange, they need to close and they have no other option. The bank can't close quick enough. What are they wanting to do? They're going to pay 50% on taxes. Or are you willing to pay 10% for six months while you, figure out what your your finance your, your lending strategy is long term so that's yeah. a good point Gabe Every, everyone's scenario is a little bit different and mm -hmm. looking at all the circumstances is important all right well you're bringing a lot of questions I like this this is this is fun uh, <laughs> all right so next question uh, what is the usual cost of a DST so what is the cost what are the costs what they should expect? Uh, so the costs are uh, in the so the sponsor has a lot of fees and that's so think about it this way if you want to be the most efficient when it comes to fees, Go out there without a realtor, go out there and buy a property yourself, manage it yourself, um, try to keep fees down to a minimum. Once again, a lot of our clients are trying to get away from the active management. Yeah. If you move down that line of, okay, now I'm going to pay a realtor, so that's going to be some fees. Now I'm going to pay a uh, property manager, so that's going to be some fees. And then now you get to this syndicated 100% passive. Yes, there are fees in there. They're going to have acquisition fees. They're going to have management fees. They're going to have disposition fees. A lot of them waive that. Um, in a lot of circumstances. Um, so fees can be anywhere between um, usually seven and nine percent on equity if it's a leveraged product and it kind of goes up from there depending on the on the actual product. but you don't pay those. Um, so for my case, if you're working with me, the sponsor pays my fee just like a buyer's broker in real estate is paid by the seller. Yeah. So think about it that way, but you won't have any fees coming out of your, let's say you got $100,000 in a DST, you'll just be collecting that four to 6% off of that 100,000. There won't be any fees after the, uh, within that 100,000. Okay. Yeah, and, and there's another question that kind of follow up. How do you get paid? So you yep. answered that question. So being yep. fully transparent, sponsor is paying you to raise money from the 1031 marketplace. And that's the value, that's what the value you offer. Okay. Just, it's just like regular real estate. Think about how the seller has a fee that they pay the buyer's broker. Okay. Um, and then the next question again, talks about the returns, returns investors should expect. So um, now I got a couple of just general cash questions as well. Um, number one, you kind of talked about DSDs. How long have they been like around in terms of you just said like a couple of years ago, they kind of became popular, but now they've just really, really become popular. Yeah, they have. And, and what's good about that too, is that, you know, the more popular it becomes, uh, it brings in more sponsors. And so, you know, these, this is a matter of, of the chicken and the egg problem. We have supply and we have demand. That demand has been growing significantly. Mm -hmm. The current and sponsors in the market have been trying to uh, fill that demand. But now we have more sponsors out there who are bringing, I got a call just two days ago from a guy who says <clears throat> they have a deal in, in Texas that they want to make a DST. The DST mm -hmm. is just a structure. The real estate's all the same. Uh, we're still talking about commercial real estate. And, you know, from my background, whether I'm analyzing a $5 million apartment deal in San Diego or a $50 million apartment deal in Texas, 
the pro forma is usually the same. The, the, the decimal points are a little bit different, yeah. but it's, you know, we're still talking about gross income minus taxes, insurance, maintenance, uh, reserve accounts, et cetera. It's not, you're not really uh, uh, reinventing anything there. Okay. Well, Gabe, why, can you throw your, share your screen real quick? Um, you can share your contact information with everybody as well. Um, so as I mentioned, Gabe, I want to just say thank you very much for uh, being a participant or being a uh, guest on the, on the webinar today. You bring a ton of information. Again, I, you're the go-to person that I go to about 1031 exchanges. Um, if anybody is interested in learning more about 1031 exchanges and DSTs, I highly recommend uh, you, reach, you reach out to Gabe. Um, easily accessible. He loves talking about this stuff. Not here to sell you into anything. I'd be more than happy to, to chat with you about it. And I'll go ahead and share his information too on a follow-up email. Yeah, so, I'm going ahead. I'm going to put it in the chat right now. Okay. Uh, because that was our office in Irvine that we have. Uh, I'm here in San Diego. If you want to get together, uh, yeah. I have to do that as well. Um, so our office is here uh, in Bayho across in Bayho across from La Jolla. And yeah, this is what I really want people to know too. You know, DSTs I think are a great option. It does not mean that it has to be your primary option. You know, if someone wanted to come with me and go strictly from active to passive, I'd say, okay, let's put together a portfolio of five or six DSTs and we'll set you up just right. A lot of our clients will might say, you know what, I want to buy direct still. I want to go buy, I want to go find that triplex or that fourplex and I want to purchase that property myself. I always say, go for it. I'm always happy. I'm an advocate for you. My whole goal is to make sure you don't have a failed exchange. Yeah. And so I'll give you a quick example. I had a client who... Just two months ago, I met him. He said he was in his last two weeks of his identification period. So obviously that time period is kind of, it's kind of a stressful time period. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, I said, oh, well, great. You know, what have you identified so far? He said, oh, I've got an offer on a triplex. Oh, no. And I said, oh, great. Just an offer. And you have two weeks left. So once again, that confidence level is not going to be very high, regardless of where you are in two weeks. I said, listen, you got to do this. You got to, the IRS gives you a number of slots. We talked about that three property rule, 200% rule. Let's fill it up with some DST since you have no other valid options. So let's not just go name one, two, three Main Street. Let's go put some real solid options in there. Mm -hmm. So we went ahead and did that. Guess what? Three to four weeks later, he calls me, says, Gabe, turns out the advertising was all wrong. There were some material issues with the property. Oh, wow. um, the financing didn't come in. I was going to I was going to have no cash flow on this property. Let's move forward with the DSTs. And he was extremely grateful that I was kind of talking to him about that strategizing on how to best be suited for that. And of course, I wished him the best of luck with that direct property. I just want to make sure that there's an option that you're there, that you're making sure you're not going to have a failed exchange. Great. And the question came in, where can I see a recording of this video? Uh, once we're done, I'll go ahead and uh, send out a, probably takes a couple of days, but I'll go ahead and send a link, post this on YouTube, and then share that link with everybody. So um, yeah, we'll have this recording available for everybody. Um, with that, uh, Gabe, I'm going to have you uh, share the screen with me or post oh, me. Oh, yeah. Let me, move, let me move you to co-host. Well, for all of our guests, we, we were practicing this today. <laughs> I, think we, I think we did a good job. <laughs> so here we go. So you should see, see uh, uh, the presentation here. Um, so again, Gabe, I want to say thank you again for being on the uh, being on the webinar today, ton of great information. I want to spend a quick minute uh, talking about our mortgage fund. Um, so as many of you are aware, a lot of you are investors currently with me, either on the trustees or the mortgage fund. We do offer uh, investors the opportunity to invest in our mortgage fund. And what is a mortgage fund? A mortgage fund, you're simply investing in a portfolio of active short-term loans. These loans are made to real estate investors that typically don't have access to conventional bank financing. That may be because most likely they need to close very quickly. Uh, they don't have a banking relationship with a bank that, um, that, that could close on the loan. So they don't show cash flow or income, but there's something about them that they just can't get financing. So they come to companies like Talamar Financial to get the financing. Um, investors earn a monthly income. So once you invest, you earn monthly income from the distributions or, or from the uh, interest payments that the borrowers make. Um, and then the security for your investment through the uh, mortgage fund is the underlying asset. So we act like, as like a bank lending money to real estate investors. And imagine you are a depositor 
in that bank. So unlike the banks today that are still not paying any income on the deposits that you have either through a checking or savings account, we can actually offer some, in, we can offer income to you. So how does that look like? How does that look in a normal world? So you, here you are an investor and you invest in the mortgage fund. Now the mortgage fund is made up of other investors. Currently, we, I think we have about 135 investors now in the fund. Uh, that fund then acts like a bank, lends that money out to, uh, to borrowers. Currently, we have about 40, I believe 44 or 45 loans in the portfolio. Those borrowers make payments every month. Those payments are made to the mortgage fund, and then the mortgage fund disperses those funds to you every month. You have the option of collecting payments, or you can reinvest your monthly distributions. What's great about this investment is it's not only open to people with uh, non-retirement funds, but also retirement funds. So we accept self-directed IRAs. We had a great conversation just a week or two ago with, I'm sorry, a month ago with Brian Davis of self-directed, of I'm sorry, AccuPlan um, on how to utilize your retirement funds to invest in investments like this. Um, why invest in a mortgage fund? Um, vet, mortgage funds offer monthly income. So if you're looking for monthly income, this is a great potential opportunity for you. You've got the security of real estate. You're diversified over a pool of mortgages. So if you invest in trustees right now, probably one of the difficulties of investing in trustees is that as one trustee pays off, you're constantly looking for the next trustee to invest in. You're not earning any income between the, that period of time. The mortgage fund offers a little different of a platform. Once you invest, you're always earning income, no matter if one loan pays off in that trustee or in that portfolio, or one loan stops making payments, you've got all the other loans that you're earning income in that portfolio. Fourth, and this is really important, is that we're talking today with Gabe about you know, deferring taxes. Well, we are, because we've structured this as a REIT, there's an actual 20% tax deduction on the income generated from our mortgage fund. So you're only paying income or paying tax on 80% of the income generated. And that's from the qualified business income tax deduction, also known as QBIT. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it is open to self-directed IRA, IRA investors. In fact, about 25% of the portfolio of the investor capital in the, in the fund is self-directed IRA investors. Um, other item, unlike a lot of other investments, as the rates go up, so do the returns in the mortgage fund. So every time the Fed increases rates, we have the flexibility to increase the rates on our loans that we give, which immediately goes right into the pockets of our investors. So where I was paying lower in the 7% range, we're now above 8% returns annualized on the mortgage fund. And then it also eliminates, as I had mentioned earlier, jumping between trustees. So those that invest in trustees, it's a much more passive investment. And Gabe made a, another comment about this is a real a passive, he offers a passive investment approach to investing in real estate. This is a passive investment approach of investing in trustees. Obviously, there's risk involved. So what are the risks of investing in a pool of mortgages? Number one, delinquency. So if you have a large delinquency rate in the portfolio, the income isn't going to be as great. So you want to make sure that you're selecting the right borrower, the right real estate for that portfolio. Number two, collateral value. Obviously, if that borrower stops making payments, as a lender, you can foreclose on that property. So you want to ensure that you understand the value of the real estate. And if, if you do have to foreclose, that there's sufficient value in that real estate that if we were to sell the property, we would get our money back. So third is liquidity. So mortgage fund offers a very liquid investment. So you can invest. We, we did waive the 12 month lockup period. We do ask investors to invest at least 12 months or greater, but because, it's a, because there are loans always coming in and going out of the fund, it's a relatively liquid investment. So here's some, some of the fund details. It is a uh, 501c mortgage fund. The offering size is about 250 million with a minimum investment of 50,000 in the fund. We have a current balance or investor capital in the fund just broke 30 million. So we're super excited about announcing that. Current return on the fund as of October, 2022 was an annualized 7.95%. 
So no confusion, that's an annualized return. You didn't earn 7.95% in October. Uh, distributions are done monthly and your security in this investment is a membership in the LLC. We did have a lockup period that has been waived. So you, if you don't like the investment, you don't feel comfortable with it, you can always pull your money out at any time. Now, one thing to keep in, keep in mind to invest with us, you need to be accredited. That means you have to have a $1 million net worth or greater, or you have to have, if you're a single investor, uh, make over certain income, same thing as married couples. And I'd be more than happy to talk to you about that and go through the process to see if you qualify as an accredited investor. Brock, I want to chime in there too. That was one of yep. the things I misplaced too. Is it, we, you have to be an accredited investor for most DSTs as well. So do you really? Okay, I was yeah. going to ask you that too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So give you an idea of the lending guidelines that we have. Just like a bank, we've got the guidelines on the type of loans that we fund. We focus on first trustees. Property types include single family, multifamily, commercial, and industrial. We do not lend on land. And we gave you had mentioned that, uh, you know, this is not, DSTs are not for land or construction loans. Um, this is exactly what we don't do either. So we just stay away from land and we stay away from construction loans. Typically we do fix and flip or fix and hold loans. So those are loans which the borrower intends to purchase the property, renovate the property, and then sell that property, obviously at a, at a, at a profit in the future, or they may refinance this out with more conventional financing, or you have the bridge loan simply a loan where a borrower needs to close quickly on a purchase and they come to us for the financing. Loan to value ratios, it's 70% loan to value. We're focused on properties here in California. Technically, if you looked at our portfolio, about 80% of it is just here in San Diego alone. So we really like to lend in our backyard. We wanna know the marketplace. Typical loan terms are six to 24 months. So these are really short-term loans. We don't wanna take long-term interest rate risk so that's why we try to keep it as short as possible on the loans. And again, it's non-owner occupied real estate. So these are loans to real estate investors. We're not lend lending to Grandma Sue for her own purchase or her own refinance. These are purely focused for real estate investors. Typical, our current portfolio looks like right now, we've got 44 loans in the portfolio totaling 23, about roughly 24 million. We're actually closing about 7 million in loans just this month. So we're going to be popping that up to 30 million, putting all that money that we raised over the last 30 days to work. Uh, average yield, as I mentioned earlier, is at 7.95% annualized. Uh, and the average loan to value of the portfolio currently is at 65.5%. Majority of the portfolio is secured on SFR, so 70%. Uh, single family and multifamily properties, 30% are secured on commercial real estate, primarily industrial. So with that, um, I want to say again, Gabe, thank you very much uh, for being a guest today. I know you, my investors that were here uh, have learned a tremendous amount. Um, I highly recommend reaching out to Gabe if you have any questions about DSTs or 1031s. In fact, I recommend just reaching out to him if you have questions about um, cash flowing real estate here in San Diego. Uh, he's got a lot of experience in the apartment side. Uh, if we had more time, I could talk about an investment that he made uh, that he just crushed it last year. And so uh, congratulations on that one too. Thanks, Brock. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah well, thanks so, for having me on. It's it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be on. I, I love talking about this stuff. It's 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 fascinating to me. So it's, it's, it's better beef because it's IRS once again, our internal revenue code. So it's not, not for everybody, but I enjoy it. <laughs> Awesome. So um, with that, I want to say thank you very much. Um, I see there's a there's a question here at the uh, the end um, regarding trustees or regarding the mortgage fund. I'll go ahead and reach out to you on that question. Um, but with that, I'll go ahead and uh, send out a recording of this video here in the next couple of days. And uh, have a great afternoon. If I don't hear from, if I don't talk to you, have a great holiday. Take care.